some of these examples in the natural sciences. We talked about, I'll give you space for that. doesn't spin very well. Hmm. Sorry, it's just going to have to be in the way of your feet for a little while. Try move it over. I thought it did rotate. I guess I'm wrong. Last time we talked about questions in the natural sciences and we talked about radioactive decay and at the end I got really excited about Newton's law of universal heating and cooling and told you how I used to predict the temperature of my coffee at the end of class and it was good fun. Uh, we're going to just hammer out one of those. Let me know when you're done. Hammer out one of those questions at the beginning after we're going over a theorem, which I did not get into last time because I got sidetracked on everything that's. Yeah. So the theorem refers to this equation that we had last time. This is the differential equation, which describes the rate of change of a variable with respect to something else. Often this is time, right? So the rate of change of something over time uh, is proportional to, so there's this number k, which we sometimes call uh, exponential growth constant or exponential decay constant, depending on its size, uh, times the function itself. So if you ever have a, a differential equation where the rate of how quickly a function changes is proportional to the function itself, it turns out the only possible function you can have that does that is an exponential function. Okay? And this is the form of it. So I'm going to just take a little bit of time to describe it, and then we're going to employ it in solving one of these Newton's law of universal heating and cooling problems. So let me first describe it. The function that satisfies this is of this form, where we have y0. This is the initial value of the function. So this is y as the name of our function at 0. So when you're talking about, for example, a bottle of iced tea, its initial temperature is, written right there, 72. That's this. If you're talking about a radioactive substance, its initial amount is its mass at time zero. If you're talking about an investment of money, its initial amount is your principal amount, how much you start with. Okay. Times e to the kx. k is exactly this k. This is the growth constant. If it's positive, if it's negative, we call it the decay constant. And then I just wanted to add a note here that x is commonly t for time. So I just wanted to note that oftentimes we're not talking about dy dx, we're talking about dy dt, in which case this is a t. It's kind of a fun result, actually. You think about all the functions that we've learned about, and products of functions, and quotients of functions, and compositions of functions, literally the only, only solution, the only function that works for this, is something like this. Not polynomials, not trig functions, the only thing is this exponential function. That's pretty special, I think, this exponential function. OK, so let's employ it. Let's do this uh, example where we've got the rate of change of temperature of something over time is proportional to the temperature. This was Newton's law of universal heating and cooling because it, uh, it can either describe as something heats up 
where something cools down. And this example can just be flipped around to show you both. For example, this one is a bottle of iced tea at room temp is placed in the fridge. So something's going to cool down. But what if I take something out of the fridge and it warms up? Same equation. What happens though? K changes signs. Okay, instead of having an exponential decay from hot to cold, we're going to have an exponential growth from cold to hot. Okay? Alrighty. So one of the first things we need to do is try and determine this constant K. Uh, and I said, you know, I used to do this with my students. I would take some measurements and then I'd wait till the end of class and take some more measurements and from that I would determine what K is. And then the next day, after knowing what K was, I would just take the initial temperature of my coffee and then tell them 30 minutes later it was going to be a certain temp. And I would usually be within a couple degrees. So this, this is actually pretty close, pretty accurate. So let's just put in what we know so far. From here, we're going to put in what we have. dt, d little t, change in the temperature over time, is, well, this constant, which we don't know, times the temperature, which we're going to re retain as a variable. That's what's going to be changing over time here. Minus the temperature of our surroundings. In this example, what are the surroundings? What is the surrounding? The fridge. So the temperature of the fridge is 44. Okay. Now, the question becomes, what is this function y? And what is this function y at time zero? So our goal is going to be to construct this function so that we can use it to predict the temperature at any time. There's several objects we don't know. What is this function at time zero? And of course, what this constant is. So what's our function y? That's the first step. You compare this to here, kind of like one of those games of what's the difference. This is a cat. That's no cat. What's the difference, right? What's our function y here? T minus 44. What is y at time zero? That's this. Notice there's no little t variable in there, right? But it's here in the paragraph. What's y at time zero? The temperature at time zero is 72. Yes. Our function y at time zero. Our function y is temperature minus 44. So we take the initial temperature minus that, and this is our initial value of y zero. That make sense? Okay, 72 minus 44, 26, 28, 82, 72, Michael. Okay, great, check, done. Can we figure out K? Yeah, we have the initial value. Right? You have the initial value? How do we find K? Oh, oh, 
this is a great idea, great idea. She's considering approximating this derivative, finding the slope between two times, right? From time zero to 30 minutes later. Okay, that's a great idea. Unfortunately, it won't yield results like this, because this is an instantaneous slope, and the slope you're considering is an average slope over 30 minutes. I hate to use this word, but logs. You're going to have to use logs, actually. If you think of this function, this is up in the exponent. How do you get something that's in an exponential exponent out? You take logs. So let's consider what we know here so far about this function. Y is equal to 28 times e to the k, and I don't know what the let's see, t. That's what we know so far. And there's extra information in this paragraph, which is exactly what Gwen was talking about. In 30 minutes, it's at 61 degrees. What is Y representing? It's representing temperature. Right? T is our time. So we pretty much know everything except K in this if we have this point, half an hour, 61. You agree? But it's a little complicated, right? Y is not exactly 61. What is Y at 61 degrees? Do you want to do things in minutes or hours? Do you care? You don't care? Check is easiest. Well, 30 is a big number. 0.5 is smaller. I prefer smaller numbers. But we might need to convert back later. Let's do things in minutes. What is y at time 30? Yes, 61 minus 44. Same problem before, right? Y is not actually the temperature. It's the temperature minus 44. Which is 1617. This gives us a really nice result. If we have 17 here and 30 here, plug in 30 for the time, plug in 17 for the y. We can now solve this using logs for k. Right? So we just take the logs of both sides, and we've all agreed to take natural logs whenever possible. So logarithm of 17 is the logarithm of 28 plus, because this is a product, the logarithm of e to the k times 30. This is just the log of 28 plus 30 times k. So if we can subtract here, the natural log of 17 minus the natural log of 28 divided by 30, we've got ourselves our constant. Is it positive or negative? Negative. Negative. How do you know? From the context of the problem, it's cooling down. How do you know from here? This is a bigger number than this. I don't know how sure you are with your logarithms. But the natural log of something, uh, sorry, natural log is increasing. So as you plug in bigger things, you get bigger numbers. So this is a negative difference on top. 
that I denied positive. So this is a negative value, which means we've got some confidence in it, at least. What is it? This is about negative 0.01663. anything else to predict temperatures, we just go through the list. We have this, we now have this, and that's it. Now I can plug in any time and predict what Y will be. And if I add 44 to that, that gives me my temperature. So what is the temperature of the T in another 30 minutes? That would be y of 60. y of 60 is just, where's the equation? Did I erase it? Oh, I, I replaced it. Let me uh, slide things over here. y as a function of t, as we've just found it, is 28 times e to the negative 0.01663 t. So at times 60, that's 30 minutes plus another 30 minutes. We just perform this computation. And if we want to know that temperature, we take y of 60 plus 44. Right? y plus 44 is the temperature. So what is this y of 60? Well, it's approximately. Uh, it's approximately actually nine point something. No, what is this? Ten point? No, nine point nine. I think nine point nine. The book actually cuts straight to the chase. It says this result is fifty four point three. Okay. Yes, fifty four point three approximately which makes this, this value 44 or less, which is approximately 10.3. Okay, a calculator would be required for that. I wouldn't expect you to actually do this computation in your head at all, nor multiply it by 28. Okay. But there you have it. In about an hour of sitting, we would expect the temperature to be 54.3. Which tells you something. I, I don't know how many of you do this. I guarantee you're going to do it at some point in time in your life. It's going to be evening after supper. And you're going to be craving something. But they're all out in the garage and they're hot. So you grab one or two and you throw them in the freezer. How long do you need to wait until they're satisfying? That's this game. Some of us may, be, may actually compute that. Some of us might not. But all of us will be satisfied with the knowledge that it does work. There's a whole bunch of myths about that sort of process. 
wrap it in wet paper towel first, plunge it into ice instead, surround it in a bucket of ice water instead. Mm. Questions? Questions? The next question was uh, part B, I erased it. Was, instead of having a given time and being asked what the temperature is then, it was instead, given a temperature, how long does it take to reach that temperature? That's just the inverse problem. So it's going to be using the inverse to the exponential, which of course is logarithms. Done with that section. 12, 13. We're going to do the next section too, 3.9, and we'll be on track. So now three and a half years, right? I've been tutoring in this tutoring room, and uh, the topic for this one is one of the most loved topics. <laughs> yes, right? Exactly. It's like, thank you. Uh, for this wonderful gift. Um, so I, I say that, tongue in cheek, of course. Uh, but uh, again, this is something that's really important, something that's really useful, too. And there's just so much to say about it. relationship between the side lengths of a square and its area. What is that relationship? The length squared. The length squared. So if I call this L or W or X, whatever, then this is also the length and the area is in fact the length squared. There's a relationship that we've just written down between these two measurements. I wonder if I change the length, how the area changes. I grow the length, the area grows. I shrink the length, the area shrinks. Intuitively, this is obvious. It's IOTTMCO. Intuitively, intuitively obvious to the most casual observer. But if I asked you instead this question, how fast is the area growing if I grow the length at a given rate? That's a different question. Not qualitative, it's quantitative about specifically how quickly the area grows given how quickly the length grows. Problems like this, where there's multiple things that are related, and these things are changing. Problems like this are called related rates problems. Very classical ones are geometric. All of them take a certain form or procedure with them. First, in the problem, there's some relationship that's given. And for us, the area was just length squared. That was the given relationship. Second, rates of change are given. And these rates are commonly written down as derivatives, wouldn't you know? Things like dA dt is the rate at which area changes over time. dL dt is the rate at which the length changes over time. 
third, this is pretty much always the way it ends up, is that there's actually before three like a 2B where you're pulling your hair out. Okay, then you put your hat on and you continue. Maybe a 2C takes something for it. I don't know. Three, implicitly differentiate. the relationship and use the rates that are given to solve the problem. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about relationships that are pretty classical and then I'm going to spend some time working on actual related rate problems. Okay? All right. Geometric is just a huge category. Triangle areas, triangle circumference, if you want to call it that, perimeter. Triangle, insert anything. So, area of triangles. You remember? One half base times height. So, if I draw a triangle, and I construct this right angled leg in the middle of it, or outside of it, wherever it falls. The length of this is the height, and the length here is the base. If I take one half of that base times its height, that's the area of the triangle. The circumference, or perimeter of the triangle, is just the sum of its lengths. Length one plus length two plus length three. I'm not going to press that down. Rectangles. Area equals base times height, or width times height. Perimeter is equal to twice the base plus twice the height. Base, base, height, height. Circles with a radius r. Area is pi r squared. Circumference or perimeter is 2 pi r. Spheres of some radius r have a volume of 4 thirds pi r cubed. What's the derivative of the volume with respect to r? Three hmm? r squared, and then simplify. The three with the three cancels. Right? 3 multiplies in front, like you said. This turns to a squared, like you said. But then the 3 divided by 3 cancels, and we've got 4 pi r squared. And you've just found the formula for the surface area of the sphere. What's the derivative of the surface area? And what does that mean about the circle or a sphere? is a great question, which I don't know the answer to. Well, I know the first, but not the These are really common things. But there's one more that kills everybody because they always forget it. And I didn't list it up by the triangle. What's the one triangular relationship for right triangles that just pops up all over the place? You have a right triangle, x, y, that's right, and this is h. That's a nice relationship between all the side lengths, only in right triangles. 
And of course, you know the Pythagorean theorem on steroids, the law of cosines, which is valid for any triangle. x squared plus y squared minus 2xy cosine of c. That also comes up. These are the most classical ones. So oftentimes the relationships in these problems aren't given. But they'll talk about something. And geometrically, in the situation they're talking about, one of these things is in there. You just have to, got to kind of pick it out. Okay, so people skydive all the time. There's related rate problems all about that. If you're standing still, watching the skydiver fall, the rate at which they get closer to you changes over, or the, the distance that they are from you changes over time, depending on where you're standing in relation to them. So you could ask, how quickly are they going towards you or away from you? That's a triangular situation, because you're triangulating your distance and hypotenuse from them. Or you could talk about filling up a cup, which is kind of like filling up a uh, cylindrical object. How fast the water is pouring in is a rate, right? So we can talk about things like this. So what I'm saying is behind the scenes in all these problems is usually some geometric situation. But then there's also the physical relationships, uh, which can also be boiled down into some kind of geometric things. But these are like your scientific, I'll say, as a category. Scientific laws. From chemistry, we've got like the ideal gas law. The pressure times the volume of a gas is equal to the number of moles of the gas times the, uh, times the gas constant, excuse me, times the temperature of the gas. This comes up all the time. Force equals mass times acceleration comes up all the time. There's just so many to list. I can't even list them. Usually, the scientific ones are given to you in the problem statement. Usually, because they're less obvious than the geometric ones that you've studied before, certainly in math classes. So usually those are given to you. Okay? Okay, now we're going to move on. Now we need to discuss rates of change and implicit differentiation of these guys. I'm just going to jump in with examples. Air is being pumped. Into a spherical. Balloon. so that its volume increases. situation of working with the sphere. Right? Step two. Specifically, what about the sphere are we talking about? Volume. Pick your model. Pick the relationship. We're not talking about surface area. We don't know anything about the surface area. We know something about the volume. So this is going to be our relationship. differentiate implicitly. Step three. Because we know things about dv dt. We're being asked what dr dt is. So we need to take this differentiate. 
differentiate implicitly. some function r that depends on time. So that's the inner function. So after I do the derivative of r cubed to get 3 r squared, I need to multiply by the derivative of the inner function. From here, we can solve for dr dt. I'm just going to cancel out the 3 and divide by 4 pi r squared. So what does this tell me? This tells me that if I have a fixed error rate flow rate of air in, the rate at which the radius changes is dependent on something. It's something I think that's kind of intuitive. gives 25. This is 100 over 4. It's 25. So I'm going to write that here now. The rate at which the radius is changing depends on what the radius actually is. Have you blown up a balloon before? Okay. It's of course hard to get it started, but how quickly does that balloon expand? Right away, when it's small. My daughter just turned five. When that radius, when that balloon is small and you get it going, it just blows up real fast right away. But then, to make it go a little bit further, you have to take like an entire another breath, right? And it just grows so slowly. It grows so slowly. The bigger this radius, the slower this thing changes. The radius determines that overall size of that balloon. Right? The rate at which that radius grows is slower for bigger radii. It's faster for smaller radii. So if I give you a radius, you can tell me exactly, at this flow rate for air, you can tell me exactly how fast the radius is changing. So at r equals 1 centimeter, it's 25 over pi. 10, twenty five over pi times a hundred, which is one over four pi. That's a lot smaller. First related rate problem. Questions about how that worked? Bless you. This process is just rinsed, uh, rinsed and repeated over and over and over again. Read the problem, determine the relationship you're needing to use, determine which rates you know, differentiate implicitly, and solve. Okay, let's do another one.
We are doing really good for time. This is a really classic example. Um, a 10 foot ladder is resting on, against, I guess I should say, a wall when it starts to slide. Top of that ladder, maybe you're concerned about how fast you're going to be hitting the ground. <laughs> First, let's draw a picture. Here's our ladder. This is 10 feet. If this wall is not perfectly vertical, we've got a different situation than what I'm suggesting right here. But what I'm suggesting here is that the wall is perfectly vertical. This is the wall. Okay. Now let's say that the bottom of this ladder starts sliding away at 4 feet per second. question then is, how fast is the top sliding? So maybe your friend is playing a dirty trick and grabs the bottom of the ladder and starts running. And you're stuck up here. <laughs> That's a dirty, dirty trick. Very mean friend. You should stop being friends. How fast are you going to fall? along that wall, if they pull this fast, or if this slides out that fast. So I erased all of them, but this is a very geometric situation. Perhaps there's multiple possibilities. What do you think we should choose? Which relationship? We don't know the base or height for the regular. We don't know the base length. We don't know the height. That's correct. But if you're just looking for a formula, you don't care. You just keep the variables, right? But let's write that down. This is very good. Let's call the bottom length x. Call the upper length y. We don't know either. But we know the area is dependent on both. We also know that the Pythagorean theorem requires both. If we chose this one, we would write it down like so. x squared plus y squared equals 100. So that was step one. Step two. Do we know either dx dt or dy dt? I'm just listing down all these variables that we suppose we might need, and I'm asking, do I know the rates of their changes? We know dx dt is 4. Do we know dy dt? That's the whole point. How fast is the top sliding is exactly how fast y is changing. This is the point of the question. What is that? Step three. Implicitly differentiate. These are both functions of time. 
So if I ask you what's the derivative of x or the derivative of y, you need to just say it's the derivative. I don't know what the exact function is. Right? So that means we need to use the chain rule on both. Taylor and Morgan, what's the derivative of a constant there? Yes. Okay, all right. We talked about that before class. Yes. Well, they knew this, just to point that out, they knew this before. How about these? Chain rules. First, you take the derivative of what you see as it is. That's 2x to the first. The derivative of this as you see it, that's 2y. But then because we took the derivative of something that we know is dependent on t, but we don't know what it is, we need to multiply by those derivatives. Just admitting we don't know what they are. You can divide both sides by 2. 0 divided by 2 is nothing. That gives us x times dx dt negative equals y dy dt. I moved the x dx dt to the right side and then switched the directions on you. Hope that's okay. And then I'll divide both sides by y. So, it's a 10 foot ladder, we don't know how high up it was, but it can reach at least 5 feet up, right? So, how fast is y changing when x is 5? So our formula here says negative x over y times 4 is dy dt. And we have a problem, right? Uh, it's a problem that I want you to solve. I don't know why. No, I mean, literally, I don't know why. figured out. Vicki, what do you want to do? Um, <laughs> yes, we can. Well, can oh, no. we use the x squared plus y squared equals 100? Ooh. Yes. Fact number one, middle of the board, x squared plus y squared is 100. This is the equation that's going to save our tails here. If we know x is 5, we can solve for y. This is pretty common in the web assigned problems, by the way, where you are given something like this, and there's other things floating around which you think you don't know, but in reality, the model that you chose from the beginning is the key to unlocking all those other values. Okay? 
So if we know x is 5, y is the root of 100 minus 25, root of 75. Right. 25 plus y squared is 100, 100 minus 25 is y squared, y is the square root of that. That goes here. In fact, if we wanted to just be really explicit about this, we would just replace this with 100 minus x squared from the very beginning. Negative x divided by square root of 100 minus x squared. And that's pretty obvious then that we only need one value of x. So when x is 5, we have this result. And that's in feet per second. Notice that this negative sign pops out pretty nicely. What does that mean? The ladder is sliding down. Yes. Okay. Is that number bigger or smaller than four? Smaller than four. That's nice. At least at this distance, you're actually falling slower than they're running. That's nice. <laughs> I mean, none of us would want, would want to run into a wall at four feet per second, for sure. But uh, that's like walking pace. You take one step, and you've covered like two feet, three feet, maybe. And if you take a step every second, that's about four feet per second. Okay? None of us want to walk into a wall, but that's survivable without injury. Probably my best question is, how fast are you hitting the ground? At what speed are you hitting the ground? That's when x is 10. Does our model support that? Our model for the rate at which we move down is negative x over the square root of 100 minus x squared. Does that model support x equals 10? No. Absolutely not. Can we stop just short of 10? And how would we find the speed at 10? Do a limit. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Yes. We would have to take a limit as x goes to 10 from the left. This is discontinuous at 10. And it's undefined for anything bigger. So we'd need to take a limit from the left. And what would you find? I'll leave that to you then. I'll ask you, would you survive it? And uh, does that mathematically agree with physically what you would expect? Those are interesting questions. Ten minutes. Okay. Uh, hmm. So from the book, there are several examples here um, that we haven't done. Filling up a water tank, a car traveling along the road, and two cars approaching each other, um, a person walking along a path, and a spotlight is trained on them. Do you have any preferences for any of those? Two cars. Two cars? That's terrifying stuff. Okay. Yeah? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, all right. Did anyone take a limit yet?
Okay, car A is traveling west at 50 miles per hour. And car B is traveling. Please not be east. North, good. At 60 miles per hour. Oh, goodness gracious. Both are headed for an intersection of the two roads. Oh, no. This is like the most grotesque example. Okay. Both are headed for an intersection of the two roads. So, A going west. What kind of car? Miata. Miata? They always have a sticker on there that says they're part of the Miata Club. <laughs> like always. I'm pretty sure it's decal that's put on there by default at the factory. Other vehicle is going north. What's its make and model? Uh, I don't even know what that looks like. Do you want a hot dog truck? <laughs> <laughs> Oscar Meyer Wiener truck? <laughs> okay, I'm going to default to physics. <laughs> Precisely. And of course it has no mass. Very of course it's perfectly aerodynamic. Very futuristic. Thank you. It's more like an energy field. It's just sort of like, anyway, this is car B, and it's traveling north at 60 miles per hour. So this is the situation, this is where they meet their utter demise. Okay. At what rate are the cars approaching each other when car A is 0.3 miles away? And car B is 0.4 miles away. from the intersection. Is this clear? How quickly are they approaching each other? What's the change of their distance from each other when they're this set of distances from the intersection? So what we're talking about here is if this car is this point on the road and this quote car is this point on the road, how quickly is this distance changing? Pick your model. Right triangle, probably Pythagorean theorem. Great, good, yes. Catch on quickly. Mm, I'm curious, do we even need to like, do any math now? Yeah, we'll just. I mean, we just solved this problem, right? So, uh, call this distance x. x is this distance. From here, the intersection, to car A. Distance Y is going to be this distance from the intersection to car B. So we have this relationship that D squared is X squared plus Y squared. Step two. Oh, that's going to be D, D. That's that distance. Uh, I'll call this one S to avoid that. We look at the model that we have. And we ask ourselves, do we know any of the rates at which these things change? What about x? Going 
Why? 60. S. That's the whole point. All right. Next, we ask ourselves, can we differentiate this implicitly? Yes, we just did. 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 2s ds dt. One might ask why there is something on the right side now and there wasn't before. It's because this distance is not fixed like the ladder's length was. This distance changes over time. So now we plug in what we have. So step three with all of this here. 50, 60. We know x is 0.3. We know y is 0.4. There we go. 2 times 0.3 is 0.6 times 50. That's 60% of 50. Plus twice. 0.4 is 0.8, what's 80% of 60? 48. Alright, 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt is 2. Oh no. Shoot, I guess we didn't have it. Do we? How do we find s? At this given instant in time, car A is here and car B is here, we know the side lengths of the triangle so we can know the hypotenuse line. Square root of x squared and y squared. How did we get it? times the unknown that we're trying to solve for. Great. 0.16 plus 0.09 is 0.25. The square root of that is 0.5. A little amount of math there. I hope it worked out. Half of 2 is 1. No, they wouldn't survive. <laughs> Not even close. The Miata would get blown away. It wouldn't be pretty. It'd be, it'd be a Mazda Miata, not what it would be. Have a great day. I'll see you all next time. Great weekend.